Rev it up and welcome to Cars Yeah, show number 1,605. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. Hello, inspiring automotive enthusiasts, and welcome to Cars Yeah. I'm revved up and so excited to share with you today a very special guest calling in from Torrance, California, Angelo Cafenteris. Angelo Cafenteris is the founder and CEO of Hyperion Motors, a division of Hyperion Companies founded in 2011. He manages its consumer product division, including their motors division. They've got an aerospace division and an energy division. He's responsible for developing the brand and launching their motors division and the new XP1, the world's first hydrogen-powered supercar. This is going to be fun. Angelo is a champion of hydrogen technology, and he's a passionate specialist in automotive engineering and design. His past includes time managing mechanical engineering and consumer products for the Mattel company, and he also worked at Ghostlight Industries. We're going to be back in a minute, so stay in your seat. Keep your seatbelt on, I should say. Uh, We're going to have a word from our valued sponsors that make the show possible, and we'll be right back. When it comes to your vehicles, things can get a little messy. Rain, snow, salt, mud, dirt, and everything Mother Nature comes up with can hurt the finish of your vehicles, both inside and and out, like that bird on the branch up above your car. I'm not worried, though, because I've used Covercraft products on my ride since 1975. That's right, since 1975. Today, Covercraft offers you a total solution for vehicle protection. They make the best-fitting, finest-made car covers in the world and offer a wide variety of materials, colors, and options that protect your paint and the interior whether your car is inside or outside. Plus, they keep your car cool when it's parked in the sun. Live where it's really sunny all the time? (laughs) Lucky. Covercraft covers and sunscreens are the best. If you've got pets, messy kids, messy in-laws, just plain messy friends, Covercraft seat covers are the perfect fit and perfect solution for keeping your seats looking new. They're easy on, easy off, and they're easy to wash too. And don't forget Covercraft's custom fit floor mats and trunk liners, plus their very handy seat back organizers. They are must haves for all your vehicles. Your car, your truck, your van, or whatever you drive will say thank you. And I've got a deal for you. If you use the code YEAH120, that's Y E A H 120, at Covercraft.com, you can get 10% off your Covercraft order. Just go to Covercraft.com, check out all the products they have. To protect your vehicles, use the code ya 120 at checkout and get that 10% discount. That's Covercraft.com and use ya 120 at checkout. Covercraft, they've got you covered. Hey, Mark Green here. I want to invite you to a virtual wine tasting event that I'm hosting on Thursday, August 6th at 5 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. You've heard me talk about Adobe Road Wineries, the racing series here on Cars Yeah. Well, I've invited some of my fellow automotive enthusiasts and past Cars Yeah guests to this very special exclusive event. And I'm inviting you too. Mikhail Haggerty and Wayne Carini will be there to share their love of classic cars. Racer Lynn St. James provides her insights on racing during these crazy pandemic times and the challenges of choosing a best of show from Jeff Love and David Lillywhite, editors of Magneto. They'll be talking about their virtual Concours. When you purchase two bottles of the racing series, you'll get a private invitation to this exclusive Zoom event that centers at Adobe Road Winery, where Vintner and endurance racer Kevin Buckler and his winemaker Garrett Martin will share the secrets to their unique racing series wines. Having enjoyed these delicious blends, I promise you, you will love the racing series. Your purchase of two bottles from the racing series get you in the virtual door. Use the code UNICEF, U-N-I-C-E-F, all one word in all caps, when you check out, and you'll get 10% off your purchase of any wine from the racing series. And Adobe Road will be giving 10% of this event sales to UNICEF. Just go to adoberoadwines.com and you'll see where to sign up. 
The wine ships promptly and it arrives quickly. There's always a seat at the table for excellence with the racing series. Go to adoberoadwines.com today and use the code UNICEF when you check out for a very fast and fun evening with me and these wonderful guests. Thursday, August 6th at 5 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. Cheers! The 4th Annual Saratoga Motor Car Auction will take place on Friday, September 18th and Saturday, September 19th. It will be held at the Saratoga Performing Arts Center in the beautiful Saratoga Spa State Park, located in upstate New York. Presented by the Saratoga Automobile Museum, a not-for-profit institution, this live event continues to be the premier collector car auction for the Northeastern United States. Proceeds from the auctions help support the museum's educational programs and exhibits that engage, educate, and inspire the automotive community. To consign your vehicle, view current inventory, and register to bid, visit SaratogaMotorCarAuctions.org. There you can learn how finance partner J.J. Best Bank and insurer partner Haggerty can help put you in your dream vehicle. That's SaratogaMotorCarAuctions.org. Hey, Angelo, welcome to Cars Yeah, my friend. Are you buckled up and ready for a fun ride? Got the five-point harness right here. I'm ready to go. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Good to have you here. I'm excited to learn more about what you're doing there because you guys are into space, you're into cars, and building a supercar with hydrogen, which is really exciting. But I want to ask you this first. What's one little thing that most people don't know about you? It's a really good question. I think it depends on who you ask. Because I've got a background in both engineering and design, uh, the engineering team might not know just how deep I go in the design realm and vice versa. But I think that both are very important to achieve a uniqueness in either category. And so really, it just matters on who you're asking. Yeah, this is really interesting to me because my wife is an engineer. I come from the design Mm -hmm. side. My father was an architect. And my father and my wife always had this fun banter between each other because she would say, oh, you're the guys with the rubber rulers. (laughs) <laughs> and, and yeah my dad okay, would laugh cool. the same way because he was always she said you guys always design stuff that can't be engineered or built so i'm really <laughs> i'm really curious about this this left brain right brain you got going on in your head of how you yeah. work those two parts of your skull together and make them flow yeah so okay i believe you need both to really be special in, in, in either category and so you know sometimes for example, in a room full of designers, if we're all brainstorming, what's going to make my suggestions unique is that I'm looking at it from an engineering perspective. And that, I think, has is, is always been my secret weapon, uh, so to speak, mm-hmm. is that I had the ability to think in that way. Because really, if you want something to look different, you actually need it to work different. Because there's a, a limited number of ways things can look. But once you make it work differently, now all of a sudden you're like, okay, now it has to look different, and now it's going to be unique. And then when you flip gears in the reverse and you're looking at it from the engineer's perspective and all the engineers are looking at a problem and trying to fix it, something that I'll often say is, what is the most elegant solution? Which sounds counterintuitive, but really what it means is, what solution is going to achieve the, 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 the results to get as many jobs done as simply as possible? And if you look at it in those terms, you're able to, I think, come up with some more unique products. And, and also solutions. And ultimately, what, you, what we're trying to achieve and what I've always tried to achieve in my background is the magic moment. And that's something that I learned uh, in the consumer products uh, industry is that if you can create something within the first few seconds where there's this childlike wonder, just imagine, you know, I've got a, 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 I've got a couple of kids, I've got a, a two and a half year old and a, and a, and a two month old. There's a moment when you show them something where they don't understand how it works. Mm-hmm. And in that moment, it's magic. Yeah. And at adults carry that same uh, wonder. And when you show an adult something, and for just even for one second, they say, how does this work? They're filled with wonder. And that magic moment is what I try to achieve through combining both engineering and design, because you can use both to achieve something that is completely unexpected. 
I love it. This is really cool. I'm excited by that. And by the way, congratulations on being a dad again, a uh, two month old. Thanks. So uh, you got right. you got a house full of little ones, which is very exciting. These are uh, spectacular times in your life. Don't let this time slip by too fast because uh, my kids are all Thank grown you. up and advice. gone. And I tell you, it goes by incredibly fast. Uh, as fast as a right. supercar, and we're going to be talking about supercars <laughs> in a minute. Nice little segue there. But I want to ask you this first. Is there a mantra or a quote or a saying that's important in your life? I, I always say it's a great way to get the tires spinning a little bit here on Cars, yeah? So, Angela, I know sure. you love cars. You love, love to drive, so grab the wheel. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, I'm definitely a, a car person. You know, I, I grew up in a family where my dad was a was car guy. He was actually a business person. He was always crawling under the car with it with practically a full suit. I was sleeve rolled <laughs> up, and I never quite understood it. And I thought to myself, okay, um, he's the car person. I guess that's that's his thing. That's fine. And he would, uh, I think, he would take every opportunity he had to take me to school in the morning as his own personal racetrack. I mean, I, I tell you, I got to, to school uh, probably as fast as anybody ever got to school, <laughs> and, and almost lost my breakfast on the way uh, coming up the other direction, but. As I got out of the car, he always said, give him hell. Okay. Just like that, give him hell. And I always look back and laugh, and I thought, okay, you know, my dad's crazy, as usual, right? But really what he was saying was, like, don't be afraid. Like, don't hold back. Like, don't let people tell you that you need to be a certain way. Just, yeah. just be what you want to be. And, and really what that means is, you know, in life, uh, what I, I think I've translated that into our business is you really have to be bold. You know, if you look at what we've uh, um, accomplished and, and uh, the time that we've accomplished it, or what we tried to accomplish, you talked to me, you know, uh, almost 10 years ago and said, you know, this is what I want to do. You think I was crazy, right? But you have to be bold. You know, I, I, uh, I'm lucky. I, I not only have my, my, my two great parents uh, in a close, tight knit uh, household, but I also had three older brothers. And, and I got a lot of great advice growing up from those three older brothers. Yeah. And, and one of them, I remember when I was first starting this, this company was, um, you know, I was afraid. I, I originally wanted this company to be a revival uh, of, of, uh, of an existing older brand that I had a special connection to. And uh, I just couldn't quite make it work with, with the technology piece because I, I, I knew that hydrogen was, was the future. And uh, my brother just said, you know, Angelo, like, you know, look at, think of it, because he, he actually has a background in literature. He goes, think of the journey of Beowulf. You know, he, <laughs> he knew that he had to be heroic. He had to be bold. He had to go out. Those people who started that, that, that car company that, that you are so passionate about that you want to revive, they weren't thinking of, 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 of their predecessors. You yeah. have to be bold. And so if there's anything I think I, I took from, from those backgrounds from my family, it was that you, have, you can't be afraid. You have to be bold. And by doing so, it's the only way you will find success. Because if it's not different, if it's not bold, or it's not achieving something unique that's, that's going to push things further, then it's, it's almost, and, and I would say uh, absolutely, not worth doing you have to do be that way give them hell you know that quote yeah. i believe originally came from an incident that took place it was uh regarding harry truman uh he was on a campaign he was actually just north of me maybe 10 minutes north of where i am in gig harbor in bremerton uh -huh. washington he was delivering a speech of course attacking the republicans because he was a democrat and during the speech somebody yelled out give them hell harry and, uh, and, and wow. that's where that, that's where that originally came from. As far as I remember, I remember wow. having this talk with somebody so you can, uh, you know, go back and maybe ask your dad if that's where he originally heard it. But I, I love the concept of it is go out there yeah. and do it. And, and you described it yeah. very, very well. Well, let's talk more about Hyperion Motors because this is cars. Yeah. We're all about cars. I'd love for you to explain more about the company. And of course, uh, this new car you're coming up with the XP1 sounds like something that uh, Speed Racer, like the X5, you know, what, <laughs> what he would drive. Uh, the world's first hydrogen-powered supercar. So tell us all about it. That's, uh, that's, uh, thank you for that introduction. That was wonderful. So the, the company is really three things. All right, number one, it's always going to be focused on clean energy. How do you deliver a clean energy to the world that's truly uh, a zero trade-off solution? And for us, we found very early on that, that that was only going to be hydrogen. And, and that is the first and, and most important thing about what we're doing is we are focused on hydrogen, we're focused on clean energy, we're focused on delivering this energy to people in the easiest possible way. So that's the primary focus of the company. The, the secondary focus, which would be 
storytelling and educational tool is the vehicle itself. You see, most people don't know the benefits of hydrogen, right? Uh, and it's our job as the people who are leading in this industry who know the most about it to help extol all the, the beautiful things that hydrogen can do. And so we do this with this XT1 in the consumer product side to show a product that is the penultimate version of what that technology, in this case, hydrogen vehicle could be. And so it's used as an educational tool to showcase the, the much longer life that our, our, our systems have, uh, the, the extreme range that you can achieve, which is, is extraordinarily exciting, uh, the very, very fast refuel time, the best energy density in the world gravimetrically, the wonderful ability for this technology to be recyclable without a lot of cost. And then lastly, uh, my most uh, favorite part would be the endurance of these things. These things love being run 24-7. They, love, uh, they don't mind heat. They don't mind cold. And so that makes them perfect for many different applications, including competitive sports. So this is, this is the idea is that the vehicle is telling the story of the energy. The energy, however, is completely necessary for this to work. And the common thread that, that, that weaves uh, back and forth between these things is, in fact, space technology. And that, I think, is one of the most exciting pieces of what we do, is that we're working so closely with NASA and taking technology that NASA has developed, in some cases, for space missions, in some cases, accidentally, that weren't necessarily for missions, and they didn't know what to do with it afterwards. And so because we have uh, a relationship with NASA where we are able to take these technologies and bring them to commercialization, we're able to provide the consumer with a, a, a product, the likes of which they'd never seen, uh, the kinds of efficiencies that not, thought not possible uh, in that particular area. So we're really excited about you know, those things. Just to reiterate, it's about clean energy. It's about hydrogen. It's about really, really no compromise products telling the story of why hydrogen is good. And then it's about bringing that all together in cutting edge fashion with this NASA relationship. And I would say that the one thing that your listeners are probably familiar with, with hydrogen is the, the chicken or the egg scenario. And so by approaching in this direction, we're, we're kind of looking at it from both chicken and egg so that we can look at both problems, solve them together, and also cross pollinate solutions between the two. You know, it's fascinating to me. And right now, so much is happening in the automotive sector that are, is radically changing the world. And of course, the concept of electric cars, which we see coming on very strong. When you think about electric car versus hydrogen, what are the advantages of hydrogen over electric? I'm so glad you asked that question. <laughs> I thought you would In be. those words. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure if you did that on purpose, but let me explain why that's so important that you use those words. Because all of your listeners would probably ask that, that same question in those words. And actually, the problem is with the question itself. You see, there is a presumption that hydrogen is not electric, when in fact, hydrogen is an electric technology. The difference that you're probably referring to is, is between hydrogen electric, using hydrogen in molecular form to, to store the ions, versus battery electric, which is using a battery chemistry to store those ions. And Perfect. So yeah. It is <laughs> the same benefits, yeah, the same benefits of really amazing torque, of efficient motors. The difference being now, you have this extremely lightweight storage medium that you don't have the weight penalty for. And because of that, you can get much better efficiencies, much longer lasting life. And you can go beyond cars into aerospace. You know, there's a reason NASA has been using hydrogen for, for 60 years since the Apollo mission. It is the preferred choice of everything that's going into space for all the reasons that I just listed. Mm. And it will be the preferred choice of not just cars in the future, but also industrials. Already, we're using a lot of industrial products that use hydrogen, forklifts that have to run 24-7 and don't, need, don't have time to charge. They're using hydrogen nonstop. Um, this is the industry and in the industrial side that is showing the benefits of hydrogen. And now it's our job to show the rest of the world those benefits as well. And that's what we're trying to do with this XT1. Well, I try to ask very good questions here at Cars. Yeah, so I'm, I'm <laughs> glad I did a good job there. So here's, here's the next question that some may laugh at, but others may not. Where do I get hydrogen? Where does it come from? Great question. So that's actually the biggest problem with the industry and the problem that we identified early on when we first started this endeavor back in 2011. In fact, we were focused primarily on the energy piece and the car came later. So the, the solution where you can get hydrogen from is, is uh, the answer is, I suppose, twofold. 
the, the way that you'd probably get it uh, in the future, if you're living in California, for sure, you get it at a local hydrogen station. You, you go to a station, you plug in the, the actual nozzle, you press the, the, the button, and in three to five minutes, you have a full tank. So that's where you'd get it if you live next to the hydrogen highway. And our mission is to bring stations like those across the country to connect both coasts so that you can get into that vehicle and drive this enormous range uh, between uh, different destinations to give you that flexibility that you don't normally get in a battery-powered electric uh, vehicle. Now, I will answer the second part of that, uh, the second layer, I suppose, and that there are different ways to create hydrogen, and we are actually going to be offering a system of, of new and exciting ways that you can recharge your vehicle. And I won't get into that now, but I can't wait to tell you about it uh, in the future, and I look forward to the time we can tell you about that. But it's not just stations. It's a whole other wave of things that you can recharge your vehicle. And that the key is to make it very, very user friendly for the consumer so that everyone has a chance to enjoy this technology without uh, it being too exclusive. Well, I'm excited to have you back to explain that in more depth, and we'll definitely do that. Now, let's talk about the car, the XP1. Uh, why start out with a supercar versus you see most car companies, let's say on the electric side, going with more commuter technology? I've had people in the show here, for instance, Intermechanic, or they're building the Solo. Of course, Tesla, we all know about Tesla uh, and the other car companies that are battery powered. I've even had some guests on that take that battery technology and put it in collector cars, old Volkswagens, old Porsches and things like that. So tell us why you're starting with a supercar. So to answer that question is it's essential. What we're trying to do is build the ultimate version of the technology so that a person can look at it and say, wow, that is what hydrogen can do. So really this first vehicle is the first of, uh, it's the first chapter of a novel we've been writing for, for eight plus years, right? We're not building this in very large volume. We're doing this so that we can begin to tell the story of why hydrogen, so that we can then tell the story of how hydrogen, and if we begin to, to, to tell the further, you know, uh, overall uh, story of what we're trying to get across. The reason I believe that, I, I, that we chose this particular type of car is because that the, the supercar, or in this case, we'll call it the hypercar, is the penultimate version of something. The version of something that is on the very top. Hyperion, the name itself, believe it or not, it comes from the Greek. Hyper, which means beyond, and eon, which means the highest possible furthest point. We wanted to build a vehicle that was beyond the furthest point, so there could be no question, right? No question about what was the leading technology in this area. And the reason we chose Space technology is an integral part of how we're going to achieve these performance metrics is because what is more American and what represents the best of America than NASA's space program? So really, not only does this car represent the best of technology, but it, it almost in a sense represents the best of American ingenuity, innovation. And that, I think, has a, has a much deeper meaning and something that we're really uh, proud about. And that, that meaning is what, what that represents. NASA and their missions have represented not just technological prowess, but also going beyond our physical borders, doing something that the whole world can look at in awe and say, wow, this is what we've achieved. We've taken a person to, to the moon. We've taken a person into outer space. This car, I'm hoping, is something that people can look at and be very proud, not just because this is an American company with, with an American workforce building this in America, but also because it's something that you can say, okay, this is where technology is headed. I'm very excited and, most importantly, hopeful about the future. I think a lot of people right now are afraid of the future. We, got, we want to make them hopeful. Yeah, we need, we need as much hopefulness about the future as we can get in this crazy exactly. 2020 year we've had. Oh, my gosh. Well, that's, exactly. a bit of, that's a bit of a segue into my next question where I ask all my guests about a challenge or a failure. Uh, I'd love for you to kind of dive into this a little bit. Take us on a journey. Now, this could be through business. could even be your personal life. It doesn't really matter, but it's more about the lesson learned and how you came out in a positive way. So let's, let's take a little journey together here in our hypercar. Sure. Okay. You know, my background in both engineering and design made me very comfortable with those respective um, studies. Getting into business in the early stages uh, with our team of uh, scientists in the early days, uh, almost a decade ago, was, uh, was a new endeavor for me. And in doing so, I wanted to, to take the best path I could. So when we got our first round of investment, my goal was to just blow this VC firm out of the water, just to say, look, 
this is the money you gave us, and this is how what, what we did with that with that capital. And it was a harsh learning lesson because what ended up happening was I had seen a lot of other companies produce essentially just a good looking design prototype. Because I can tell the difference. Most people can't, but I can tell the difference. I see a car like, that's not real. That doesn't work. And I did not. I, I was determined to not make Hyperion one of those companies, mm -hmm. right? So I said, I'm going to make this thing work. I'm going to make this whole thing function, and I'm going to show them a working prototype uh, within the first year and a half, which is what we actually accomplished. And so we did that, and, and it was not easy. You know, it was a Sudoku puzzle of so many different variables, because if you want to achieve anything that's unique and exciting, it's not going to be easy. And it wasn't. And we worked tirelessly. And we, we played with those different numbers and those different positions of that Sudoku puzzle to get the right balance to get this car to function and get this user interface uh, with the refueling process and the, where you're going to get this hydrogen uh, extensively. And when we showed the VC firm, ultimately, this big you know, uh, reveal, we were expecting a lot of you know, uh, pats in the back, a lot of attaboys. Because we had really, you know, for lack of better words, we killed ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. We worked hard. yeah, we worked hard. And they were like, nah, well, that's you know, pretty good. And we were shocked. I mean, they were excited, but we, we expected there to be a massive flow of capital following in that moment. And there right. wasn't. And yeah. we're like, okay, what did we do wrong? So we were yeah. like, what, what did we do wrong? And I went back and I, was like, I went back to the original, you know, uh, the presentation. We thought, okay, what did we do wrong here? And I realized what it was. We had showed all of the the once all the, the one part of the brain and not the other part of the brain we didn't spend any time telling the story of why you actually wanted to drive this car why this car was going to be exciting to drive and why you even wanted to have a hydrogen infrastructure at a lower cost because the, the car needed to be there so we then realized okay we told half the story without telling the the first part right, right yeah we we took it for we took it for granted because we were so deep and then we said okay we have to absolutely make sure that we never do that again. And we now have to switch gears for the next six months sure. and tell the other piece of this story, which is, this is why you want this vehicle. So we said, okay, guys, we're going to do what we're going to call a design review for all the investors. We had all the technology working. Let's, let's put a nice package around this thing. So we, we made this really cool vehicle, right? Which you guys are going to be seeing the, you know, years later what that became. And we had another show and it was just like massive. They were like, oh my God, they're so exciting. They were, they were, they all, okay, I bring my, my kids. I want to bring my wife. I want to, they were like, I want to drive this car. Like, this is, it was a complete reversal. It's like, okay, wow. So turns out you have to have both pieces in place. And what I think we took away from that was, guys, we can't just make, a be the best way to refuel this vehicle, we actually have to make the best <laughs> value proposition of why I even want hydrogen. Right. Because that, that story wasn't being told. So that became the mission. That's why we're starting with the car, you know, right here in August. We're going to be showing the car so people are like, oh my goodness, I had no idea a hydrogen car had that potential. I had no idea that that, that it could has that range and that refuelability. And, and then, and then and sort of uh, dispelling some of the myths about hydrogen. Many people are like, oh, yeah, but my battery technology can, can, can also do this. Like, actually, every time we do that with your batteries, this is what you're really doing. Like, we really, right. there's not a lot of people that, that, are, that are talking about hydrogen the way that it needs to be talked about because there's such an enormous interest in battery technology. And you know how the investment world goes. It's just, they just want to follow each other. It was not easy, I can tell you this, to get people to invest in hydrogen when everybody and their uncle had a battery electric car company coming out. Right. We had to explain to people at great length, this is what hydrogen does. This is why it's important. This is why it's the future. And we're just really excited that we got the, the vehicle and the company to a point where we're really proud to, to, to show it off and, and begin to tell that story. You know, what comes to mind here are the words of Simon Sinek, first start with why. Uh, he wrote yeah. a whole book about it. Uh, if you watch the TED Talk, you, and I love the concept of it, and it really helps in all spec, uh, aspects of life and business. But why? Why are you exactly. really doing this? So I'm so glad <laughs> that worked out, and it's a fascinating story. I think it's great. We're going to take a short break and thank our sponsors again. When we come back, I want to talk a little bit about your personal passion for cars because, Angelo, I know you're a car guy, so sit tight, keep the seatbelt on, and we'll be right back. <laughs> thank you. 
American Collectors Insurance. That's who now protects my Porsche Turbo. Yeah, the one I call my orange crush. When it came time to renew my policy, my carrier jacked my rates up, even though I'd been with them for years. I'd never made a claim. No tickets, nothing. What's with that? Adios. So I started shopping around and kept hearing about American Collectors Insurance from fellow automotive enthusiasts, friends, and folks in the car industry. I did some investigating and learned that American Collectors Insurance have been protecting collector vehicles since 1976. I'm not a price shopper when it comes to insurance. I want to be able to sleep at night. I also want agreed value protection for my special ride. With an agreed valued policy from American Collectors Insurance, I'll be paid what my vehicle's full agreed value is. A number I set with the insurer at the start of the policy so I know there will be no surprises about what my car's value is, should something terrible happen. I shopped around and decided to protect my car with American Collectors Insurance. Give them a call for a quote today at 866-ACI-YEAH, that's 866 866- 224-9324 and protect the ones you love. Make sure you tell them Mark sent you. You'll be glad you did. American Collectors Insurance. Classic car insurance designed by collectors for collectors. My favorite collector car magazine is Keith Martin's Sports Car Market. I've been a subscriber for decades. Sports Car Market is the Wall Street Journal for enthusiasts and collectors. It's your monthly must-read. Whether you dream of owning a collector car Maybe you have two, or maybe you've got 200. Sports Car Market has been around for 31 years, and it's filled with valuable articles, intelligent write-ups, and the latest auction sales. Go to sportscarmarket.com and subscribe today. And don't miss my weekly podcast with Keith Martin titled Buy, Sell, Hold. It's the essence of collecting. We talk to the movers and shakers in the collector car world. Here's a couple deals I have for you just for listening here on Cars Yeah!, if you use the checkout code Cars Yeah, you'll receive a 50% discount on your digital subscription at Sports Car Market. That's an exclusive offer from Cars Yeah. And guess what? Here's another deal. If you'd like to get the actual magazine, use the code BSH for buy, sell, hold. That's code BSH. And you'll get $10 off your annual print subscription. That's right. $10 off. Both of these are exclusive offers here at Cars Yeah for Sports Car Market Magazine. Just go to sportscarmarket.com and get your deals today. Let's take a pit stop from the conversation and talk about my charity of choice here at Cars Yeah, America's Automotive Trust. America's Automotive Trust is a group of like-minded nonprofits working together to preserve and promote car culture across the country. Together, they provide scholarships and grants to aspiring technicians and restoration artists. They provide youth education programs and bring communities together through auto-related events, car shows, and drives. One of those nonprofits is very near and dear to my heart because it's right down the road from the Cars Yeah! headquarters. It's the LeMay America's Car Museum in Tacoma, Washington. One of the world's truly great automobile collections and one of those must-see bucket list destinations for car people like you and me. If you haven't seen it, I hope you make a trip soon, and if you have seen it, it's probably time to visit again. To learn more about this fantastic museum, go to www.americascarmuseum.org, and while you're there, you can donate to help them keep their engines running. That's www.americascarmuseum.org. All right, Angelo, we are back, and I'd love for you to share a story that instigated that personal passion you have for cars. What was that pivotal moment in your life when you knew you were going to be a car guy? So I mentioned that, you know, my father was a big-time car guy. And and I, I my older brothers weren't as into cars, but one of them was, was pretty into it. Mm-hmm. And we had, you know, we were too young to drive cars. So my best memories as a child were for sure in the car. You know, in the family station wagon, we're going for a ride in an old, uh, believe it or not, a 49 Chrysler, which we called the old fogey. My dad would uh, pick us up from uh, <laughs> the old, yeah, the old pick us fogey. Up, the old fogey. Yeah. <laughs> Funny. Yeah. He'd pick us up from uh, football practice all together. Uh, we did everything together. Uh, as a parent, I realize now is to, to keep things uh, logistically easy. Um, but uh, he'd pick us all up. We'd go for ice cream. Not, I grew up in Ohio. Not a whole lot to do in Ohio besides get ice cream and go to the movie theaters. But but believe it or not, you don't need to do much more than that if you want to, you know, 
enjoy family time, which is what we did in the car. But I would say that I didn't realize it was just part of my life. I didn't realize I was a car person. The moment that I, I realized I was a car person was as I, I got to that age, it was probably 14. And uh, I, I bought my dad this book for Christmas. It was called The Encyclopedia of Classic Cars. And I, I, I 100% was like, yeah, this is for my dad. It has nothing to do with me. And, and I got it. I gave it to him. He was like, oh, this is for me, huh? I was like, yeah, yeah, of course. He goes, and then he made a joke, kind of like when uh, Homer buys Marge the bowling ball. And I was like, what are you talking about, dad? I mean, this is for you. And, and yeah. I thought, I wonder why I said that. He must have seen this spark earlier than I did because before I knew it, I read that whole, and it was not you know, a small book. I read that thing cover to cover. Yeah. And I was just sucked in to the lore, the lore of every, because the beautiful thing about this book was it told you this history of how the car company started, the founders, the first car, and then it took you to like a series of highlights of all the cars. Oh, nice. And it was, yeah, it was, uh, it really took me. And, and, and that was the point where I was like, okay, well, like, what's, what kind of car am I going to drive? What's my first car going to be? I was really, of course, you know, excited about what, 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 what kind of car can I afford? What can I, where's, where's my, uh, my sweet spot? What can I get? And I, I was determined to find that perfect car. Sure. And um, I think that uh, th that was when I, 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 it occurred to me, you know, my brother's all sort of, uh, you know, leaving home, going to college. And before you knew it, it was, it was pretty much just me and my dad and our car obsession. <laughs> so <laughs> it was pretty clear at that point that I was like, okay, I'm pretty in deep in this. I don't know if this is going to go away, but uh, it is a, uh, almost a, uh, a sickness to the point of, of the obsessiveness that we both got into to cars. So that's when I realized that, that, that Christmas, uh, probably the, the day after Christmas is, pouring through the page of that book and to the point where those, those covers quite literally fell off. I still have the book. Uh, actually, it's, it's in Ohio, but uh, I still kept it because it was so important to me. But that was the moment that I, I think I really realized that, oh, yeah, this is this is serious for me. That's nice. A nice sharing with your father. What was the first really special car in your life? You know, that's a, a, another great question. You know, my dad was the type of person who had a million projects going and couldn't quite find the time to finish any of them. Right. Sure. And, and one car that, that was just always in the garage, I think that he had done some work for a person who uh, was a painter and they had this old uh, 1974 MGB and um, the body was great, but there was no engine. And I would always just look at this car, probably, you know, I think we got it when I was maybe like nine or 10. And I would just stare at this thing all the time. Like, man, I wonder why is the, the, the front of the, the car so much higher? And the, oh, because there's no engine here. And the springs are popping this thing up. And uh, I was like, oh, but this is kind of cool car. And then, you know, it was just a thing. And then before I knew it, I was, you know, getting like probably 15. I was like, you know, I can't afford my own car, but I got this thing here. And this is pretty cool. And I actually really think it's a, a simple, but, but you know, uh, kind of really straightforward design. I really like it. It's a convertible. Like, I want to fix this car. So I knew my dad was never going to find the time to fix it because he was always so, so busy with a million other things. So I said, I'm just going to try and fix this thing myself. And Kid, yeah, I don't know what I'm doing. So, of course, I'm 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 trying to find the parts. I'm asking my dad a million questions. Oh, where, where, where is it, what is this thing? A cylinder head? Oh, how's it going? Oh, what, what kind of bolts do we need? Oh, I have to uh, soak this in oil. And I was asking all these questions. Well, what, do we have the gas? Do we have to order these things? And so I was going through all these questions. Finally, he's like, you know what? We're just going to do this together because it's the only way to, to to get this thing done. So before you know, we we, we built that engine together. And it was definitely a special, you know, bonding experience for with me and my dad. And I had thought that this was a special car to my dad that he, that I was going to help him fix it, but that was going to be it. And I, you know, had him on my own. Maybe he let me drive it once in a while, but we fixed it. And he was like, you know, Angelo, like, this is like, he never said this is yours. Like, it's not my name or anything like that. But he was like, this is, have fun. Like, yeah. enjoy the independence and freedom of, of a car. And, and you know, I, I got my license, you know, around the time that this thing had been uh, fixed up. And tell you, man, that MGB, I, I, that was my, that was, a lot of very, very special memories for an adolescent kid uh, was in that vehicle. And, and um, to be honest with you, I, I, I feel kind of bad for, you know, future generations because there's not a whole lot of that passion for car, for that dependence. It goes on and wrong. I love technology. This is a technology company that we're talking about. But, you know, ride sharing is great, but, but the independence and the freedom and, and learning about cars of the past is a pastime that um, I'd love my, my children to enjoy. And, and I, and I, I remember someone told me this in the industry. I didn't believe them. They said, hey, ask a person uh, what their favorite car is. Ask the young person what their favorite car is. And I said, well, I'm sure they're going to have a favorite car, but he does. And uh, and I, I was, remember, I was, believe it or not, I was like, working late in the middle of the night at uh, like a Starbucks or something. And I, saw, I saw this group of kids. I was like, let me just 
test this theory. And I asked them, hey, what's your favorite car? And uh, they're like, I don't really have one. I like my phone. And I, I remember being I like my kind phone. of depressed. <laughs> no, I swear to God. I swear to God. They said, I like my phone. And I was like, okay. I said, I, I like my phone too. But if you had to pick a car, like a badass, super cool car, what would it be? And like, they're like, I don't know, like whatever car was in the last chain is gone. That's how little they thought about it. And I was just like, man, this, yeah. is, a, this is Americana. Like how this, this is, is changing. And, and yeah, I have, I have a lot of friends in the industry working at, at different companies that are doing <laughs> unexciting cars, I should say. I, I don't want to you know, disparage sure. anything, but you asked me earlier, why are you building a supercar? Mm-hmm. Why are you building a car that, that, okay, I'll tell you why. What car would be the ultimate car that we actually want to drive? I'm not going to be able to afford the, the ultimate version of this vehicle, but you know, maybe the lower version of this vehicle I'll be able to afford. I want to be able to to have this representative of this ultimate vehicle so that people can be passionate about cars. Cars are not just consumer products and they never will be. And I hope they don't ever just become that. Right. Cars are a very important part of, of just mixing independence with a personal freedom, dare I say, sex. You know, adolescence, you know, you're, you're becoming aware of the opposite sex or the same sex. It doesn't matter. You're becoming aware of your emotion, right? Mm-hmm. And that car represents all of those things. And the car to me is the ultimate product, yeah. the ultimate product. And it is there's nothing. A car can make a mundane memory extraordinary. Yeah. And, and, that, and that is the only consumer product that I can think that can make that happen. And that's why we need to keep the the dream of life. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I'm going to crawl in your head here, Angelo, and ask you this. If you woke up tomorrow and you were manifest as a vehicle, not what you want to be, but <laughs> how you perceive your personality as a vehicle, what would you be? Okay. Another great question, which is difficult to answer because it, it'd be that, that question can only be asked to people who know me best. You'd have to ask my wife that question, right? Okay. I can only tell you what I, I'd want to be. Right. Yeah. Um, because um, when I poured through that book that I talked about, that it's like a pleated plastic cars, I actually um, I found the final, the ultimate car. I, I, I couldn't afford it, but I found it. And you know what it was? What? It was a, a 1977 Lotus Esprit Series One. And the reason I'm, I'm sure that because I had gone through a phase where, where me and my brothers every uh, weekend would rent a, a James Bond movie and watch it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but that was probably part of the spy who loved me. But but I think more than that, I had that encyclopedia of classic cars and I, I became enthralled and fascinated by Lotus, the company. You see, um, Lotus, the, the company founder of Colin Chapman, had this philosophy that I, you know, definitely, you know, think about all the time, which is having one part to as many jobs as possible, you know, basically simplify and then add lightness. Right. Mm-hmm. And Gijarto Gijaro had the same or similar philosophy in design. Right. His think, th- thought was minimize dramatic proportion, super duper simple details. Right. And they're really if you th- if you if you boil it down, they're the same philosophy and both of them extraordinary pioneers in the industry. And for one moment in history, these two great engineers and designers crisscross and created what I think at that moment in my life and even still today was the ultimate car. This, this Lotus Esprit achieved its greatness through simplicity and low weight. Sure. And I, so basically I had, I had found that, that as the ultimate car and I love that vehicle. And I, I would dare to say that I'm those things, but I would tell you that because it's a great balance of engineering and design, I can tell you that I aspired to be that vehicle. There you go. That's a good answer. And I do remember that James Bond movie because they deviated from the Aston Martin to the Lotus. Story there the too. car that yeah. could, uh, could you know, fly through the water just like on the, on the, <laughs> the land. And uh, yeah, I, right. I especially like the yeah. uh, theft deterrent system. Uh, if you recall in that car, yeah. <laughs> it's like, kaboom, uh, he's not going to steal any more cars. So, uh, yeah. They had to destroy the evidence. Uh, yeah, the everything. Technology was too valuable. Yep, everything, <laughs> everything's gone. All right, we are entering the last lap. I'm going to fire off some questions. And I'm going to ask for some very quick answers on these, uh, kind of come some quick blips of that Lotus Esprit throttle. So here we go. What's one of your personal habits you believe has contributed to your success over the years? Hard work. I don't. I don't believe in, in, in people putting barriers, limitations on their own abilities. So uh, by that I mean, if you want something bad enough and you work hard enough, you can achieve and learn anything. 
right? It's simply a matter of dedication and sacrifice. I live by this, and it, it and it is the one and only thing that makes me maybe different from others. And I think that everybody ought to think this way because the world would be a lot more open. Uh, yeah, definitely. Ideas. Maybe, and I dare say this, I sound like an old guy. A lot more young people need to re- realize that. If you want something, you got to yeah. work for it. It shouldn't it be really handed do. to you. Uh, it won't have any yeah. value that way. If you could uh, have a drink or a meal with anyone in the automotive industry, living or deceased, who would it be? I actually have two people, one living, one deceased, if that's right. Yeah. It's the same two people I mentioned. It, it's, it's Colin Chapman would be the deceased. Mm-hmm. I'd love to just get to know the guy. I've read a lot about him, and um, it would just be fascinating to have a, a drink or dinner with him. And then, and then his counterpart would be Shujaro. I'd love to sit down. Yeah, he's alive. Yes, I'm so hoping that one day I can meet him. Um, <laughs> hopefully, I can. He spoke at my college uh, graduation for the previous class. I just missed him. So, um, man, wh- that would be wonderful. And, and hopefully by some stroke of luck, I might be able to do that still. So that's the dream of mine. That would be cool. I've been working on getting him on this show. He's difficult to track down. He, I've gotten an, I've gotten a yes, just haven't gotten a date committed yet. So as soon as I do, I'll say, hey, uh, I've got a guy who wants to talk to you. His name's Angelo. So uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll see. What okay, we... honestly, uh, life goal achieved at that moment. I'm not sure I will have motivation to continue on because that would be amazing. Thank you. Please, please, please. Thank you. I'll do that. my I'll do my best for you, Angelo. <laughs> uh, what's the best automotive <laughs> advice someone else has ever offered you? You know, I would say that uh, you know, growing up in a in a car environment, I definitely had a lot of pieces of advice that were car related. You know, but I would say what really stuck with me, if I can give you two answers again, one for the engineering side and one for the design side. On the engineering side, I remember it was it was Clay Studio, and um, it was a gentleman who was, you know, and Clay Studio is basically boot camp for for young automotive designers. Mm-hmm. And um, I was just, you know, the, the word is if it looks right, it is. And we, it was something that was told to me that I didn't quite understand at the time. And I guess the the meaning is, if you get it right, don't overthink it. Leave yes. it be. Yeah. Go on, right? Yeah. And when it comes to the engineering size. Side, it's actually a little different. It's hurry up and fail. Just <laughs> throw it, no, really throw it together because it's all about learning. You're going to learn 10 times more by watching something fail than you would by getting the best result. It's that old quote where perfectly executed, executed plan next week is not as good as a, a executed plan right now, an imperfect plan right now. So that would be the two pieces of advice I'd say. Love it. How about a resource out there that's a go to for you? Is there a great one you could share with us today? You know, that you have to really keep your eyes open. I'd say that if you're trying to find a particular solution, the, the, the possibilities are endless. So don't, don't think that it's only going to come from one source. You get the best advice in the most unexpected source. I don't want to say go to one place. The only thing I could say in terms of resource is learn from their, your predecessors. Learn from people who've gone it. Take advice from people or, that are in places that you want to be. And if you want to learn about cars, Get an old car, start fixing it up, and start learning about cars. And if you want to learn about the history of cars, pick up a, a book about the history of cars and, and learn what what the last 100 years have shown us. You really need to understand the history if you want to change it. And I think that it needs to be uh, taken to the next level. It needs to be changed. Well, nice segue into my next question, and that is a book you'd like to share that you've read. Of course, it has to be the book in my life that, that kind of brought this whole thing together, which is the Encyclopedia of Classic Cars. Now, I think I know the author. I did a quick search on it recently, and let me just see here. I, you know, I might have to get back to you on the actual author on that, but uh, it's called Encyclopedia. Oh, here we go. It's Kevin Brazendale, I believe is the, the, the title that I had, uh, okay. but I might have to circle back and make sure that's, that's the correct Okay. Version, because there's a lot of similar titles. Yeah, no problem. Well, you'll get that to me, and I'll make sure, listeners, I put that on Angelo's show notes page so you can find that. There's a great place on the website as well at Cars yeah, under the Resources tab called Guest Recommended Books, where all my inspiring automotive enthusiast guests give me books to reference. There's over 1,600 of them there. I've made it really easy for you to buy them. Just click, takes you right to Amazon. Boom, you're done. All right, Angelo. We're up to the checkered flag. I'm going to buy you a very cool car today. Uh, whatever you'd like, whatever you'd like to park in your garage. I'm going to make sure it ticks all the boxes, though. Something that is fun, something you'll drive, uh, but it's something you can't sell, and it's the only one cool thing you can have in your garage. So what can I buy you? 
Okay, here's the thing. There's already an answer to that question. It is that 1977 Lotus Esprit S1. Yeah. I actually do have it in my garage. I rebuilt it from scratch eventually as I got older and learned more about cars. I found one for, for uh, a good deal. Nice. I, I, I fixed it up in my, my uh, early youth, and I still have it today. And believe it or not, it actually has checked the, not all the boxes and more, and I don't want anything beyond that. But I could tell you that what I've done here with this wonderful team of scientists and researchers behind us is what is that other vehicle beyond this version of the, the car that I have? And that, I think, would be this Hyperion XP1. <laughs> yeah. There's the past. Yeah, the past is that, that 77 is free. And the future for me is this XP1. That is, to me, now the next ultimate car beyond that, that Lotus. Sounds great to me. I think that sounds pretty cool. <laughs> Angelo, you've taken me on an exciting, enthusiastic ride today. I can tell you're passionate about all this, which is fantastic. Really enjoyed learning more about Hyperion and what you do for a living and your team there. I want to thank you for sharing this journey. Before I let you go, though, is there one little parting piece of wisdom or guidance you might offer us before you drive off into the past in that 77 Lotus Esprit and head into the future <laughs> in that wonderful new XP1? Nice, wow. nice, nice job, hey? <laughs> yeah, that was good. That was good. So this was actually a piece of advice that was given to me uh, from our very first investor. His name is uh, Lawrence Lubbers. We call him Lar, Dr. Lar. And um, we, we had put a bunch of money into, into something and it didn't work out. And I was down because I'm a frugal person. And, uh, and, you know, probably why he invested. But he basically said, Angela, don't worry. He goes, don't feel bad about this mistake. We just paid a little bit of tuition. And now we learned a lesson that's not going to go away from us. And I just want young people, you know, we're, we're in this interesting culture where they're afraid to make mistakes. And people just need to know that mistakes are the best teachers. The best, you, you'll never forget a mistake. And if you haven't made a mistake in your life, you're about to be in for one because yeah, yeah. you're going to make a mistake. You need to make a mistake. The question is, what do you do after you made a mistake? You need to adjust. You need to learn from that mistake. You need to move forward. And you need to keep pushing on. You know, there is no such thing as failure. That is a, a word that I'd like to eradicate from the English dictionary. Failure only exists in sports where there's a time clock. Yeah. Right? Of course, in life, we have a time clock, clock. But while we're alive, if you make a mistake, you can still fix it. All you've got to do is not quit. There is only quitting, not failure. Just keep going forward. Keep moving past. Learn from your mistakes and, and keep correcting and, and making yourself better. Perfect. I love it. Yeah, I had a guest on the show that said every year her New Year's resolution is to make 100 mistakes in the new year. And that meant she That's tried great. 100 new things. So great thing That's to keep true. in mind. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, How can people absolutely. learn more yeah. about your company? You know, it's pretty straightforward. They can go to HyperionMotors.com. Uh, that'll, that'll tell them the latest and greatest. They can uh, check out the same name on Instagram, uh, Twitter, and also Facebook. Uh, we'll be doing uh, uh, some exciting uh, uh teasers of, of this, uh, this, this big event uh, that we're going to be releasing virtually uh, in August. And so I believe that the, the stories will come to them, but if they want to find out even more, uh, definitely go to the website, HyperionMotors.com. There you go. That's H-Y-P-E-R-I-O-N, Hyperion Motors. Go there, check it out, and follow them. Uh, August is going to be an exciting month for sure. Angelo, thanks for being so generous today with your time and expertise. And as I said, your passion, which is contagious. Until you and I talk again, I'll see you down the road and into the future. Oh, my God, yes. Thank you, Mark. Have a great day. <laughs> you too. This has been great. If you're listening to Cars Yeah, you've probably spent some time working on your favorite ride. But how confident are you working on your finances? You may be able to rebuild a fuel injection system, but can you decipher the details of a mutual fund? If you're like me, investments, insurance, annuities, budgeting, and other financial concepts may seem a bit daunting, but what if I told you there's a book that describes these subjects and more in an easy-to-read and a very humorous way? My friend Chris Kimball, CFP, a longtime sponsor and past guest here on Cars yeah, has written that book, and it's titled The Saga of Ike and Penny, a couple's humorous journey through the confusing world of finance. It's a fun look at things you need to know, everything from investing to effective ways to get rid of credit card debt, and it's probably the only book on finance with a VMAX on the front cover 
and a classic Mini Cooper on the back. The book's available at Amazon for just $10, and this book will dramatically improve the direction of your financial future. I gave copies to each of my children. All securities are through Money Concepts Capital Corp. Christopher Kimball Financial Services is not affiliated with Money Concepts Capital Corp. Get your copy, The Saga of Ike and Penny, today. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah! Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah! Yeah!